Okay, hey, welcome to EVTV. I'm your host, Rich Flingy. This is our new sidekick here at EVTV, Ian Harris. We've got a lot to talk about today. We're going to talk about a whole big picture of uh, some of the EV business, and then we have one of our special EVTV builds coming up towards the end. But, you know, the one thing I always do is pay homage to Jack. I, I was here in the early days. The, the mindset, the discussion, the world has completely changed in its relationship to EVs. They are now really everything they are. A dominant topic of the news, of the investment daily, the uh, uh, whole world uh, now seems to be conversing about electric vehicles. And what it's hard to understand is 10 years ago that was a dream. That was absolutely Star Wars fantasy stuff. We wore an unwelcome uh, stepchild at any conversation, and family members would say, I'm going to keep my gas guzzling SUV till Jesus comes back. So it is uh, a completely different world, and they really want them. In today's show, we're going to talk about the new Model S Plaid, some cool stuff there, absolutely. Uh, a little bit about the Mustang Mach-E, kind of how they're approaching the fix to that. Uh, the new uh, Ford Lightning electric pickup, that's a big one, and I call it the, the drivable battery. The secret, nobody in the utility world, big oil, or anybody wants to know is that this technology of the drivable battery is going to work. And of course, we're going to finish up with our solar battery build. Ian is a little more of a car guy. Uh, he has worked in car dealerships. Uh, you know, talking with the Model S Plaid, which has all sorts of neat stuff, we'll go through a list of those. But uh, the one thing that you want to see that's very clear with this is that, interestingly enough, Tesla is somewhat going back to what uh, built the auto industry, which is they put their newest and best stuff in the newest and latest models that they could get the most money out of. And Tesla is following suit with their Tesla Model S Plaid. Mm -hmm. The Plaid name is a tongue-in-cheek poke at a parody film that was called Spaceballs, that uh, I just loved when it first came out, which was a parody of the Star Wars films uh, back in the late 70s. So it is uh, a world on top of a world on top of a world now. And uh, I, I suppose anything goes, but Plaid was a, uh, uh, when the spaceships were going to go to light speed, and they wanted to go faster than light speed, they went to plaid speed. So now we have a Tesla Model S. Uh, we're going to run down a few of the features that we here at EVTV uh, think is very important. Uh, they do have a new battery pack. Didn't really say a lot. Did no. you get any information on that? No, they uh, just kind of grazed over it. That, that means it's top secret. I'm guessing, and I think a lot of the conventional wisdoms would say, it will be more like a Model 3 pack, the long uh, cell packs at um, 96, 90 volts, a uh, little different configuration, all glued together. Uh, but that's my guess. Uh, the 4680s, you think and they're in there? Maybe, could be. Didn't say anything He's about He's saving them for something. Yeah, Where's the 4680 going to be? Who knows? It's going to have uh, extended range. That's really cool. And you want to talk about fantasy again? These are uh, uh, 390 mile range on a single charge, 412 miles on the dual motor. That is incredible. Those are numbers that, uh, again, game were changers. The, they were game changers. They were the fantasy conversation 10, 12 years ago. Uh, it also has a very low drag coefficient. Uh, that is something that was a lot of discussion. Uh, people don't realize, and, and if you look at even the design of an ICE car, 
you're pushing a you're pushing a bulldozer down the road. You have mm -hmm. a radiator at a complete perpendicular, and obviously very very uh, energy inefficient. So they have improved their drag coefficient. Uh, now I was there. I went and picked up the first Model S uh, for Jack here at EVTV when it came out. Went to St. Louis and drove it. I uh, rode in it. It was a cool car. It was absolutely sweet to sit in, uh, great visibility, fantastic experience, uh, and you felt like you were riding almost in a spaceship. Uh, and they've kept that base structure. The base look of the Model S is working. It's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a classic at this point. And uh, so the overall uh, modeling, uh, the look of it, still about the same. And it's really solid, super cool. It's a winner. It's still a winner. Comes in about $129,000. It's a pretty good penny. But in this world, you know, when... Price you pay for luxury. The price you pay for luxury. People want it. Uh, it's got the brand image. So I'm sure this Model S Plaid is going to be very successful. Okay, now, uh, they improved their heating and cooling system. So an improved heat pump, 30% gain in energy uses, usage, big that's deal. a big one. All of your auxiliaries, all of your environmentals are a big part when you drive a battery pack. I'm not so sure some of their mileage range may have been gained from some of their other improvements in other areas. Yeah. So uh, now, carbon overwrap rotors. What do you have to say about that, Ian? They're... Groundbreaking. Elon said himself that they had to build a machine specifically to install the rotors. They're, uh, they're a lot different than anything that's ever been, and it's the first motor to ever have carbon rotors. Um, but the reason it needs those is because it spins all the way to 20,000 RPM, which has it's not done been done, and uh, no one even really talked about it. Nope. And uh, he snuck that one in there, didn't he? Yeah, that's like so like Elon. He absolutely he keeps a few in his back pocket. It is close to jet engine technology now. We are driving with magic rocks and now almost an electromagnetic jet engine in a, in a plane. I did watch some of the acceleration videos. We haven't got our Model S plaid in yet, so <laughs> we're still on the list. But if it shows up. You viewers will be the first to see us riding around in it. Uh, but I did watch some of the YouTubes where the guys show the acceleration, and it almost looks like a video on Fast Forward when oh, you yeah. watch the speedometer. 1.99 seconds to 60 miles an hour. Uh, and that, you know, I think that's one of the sweet spots of electric vehicles, uh, getting in and out of traffic, coming in down on an exit ramp, or ramping into moving traffic. Uh, an electric vehicle behaves differently, so they've got that little part figured out because it's uh, that's very quick. So that's the Model S Plaid. Uh, we'd love to hear from our viewers. Uh, the only you know the only thing that probably caught my eye is possibly a negative. They're going to put a PlayStation in the back seat. Is that <laughs> true? I don't know, but something about like a PlayStation, and I don't know that that's. That just, yeah, that's a little edgy there, you know, <laughs> kids back there on a PlayStation. I have a, hopefully the cord won't reach up front and the driver, <laughs> the passengers will be playing also. But that is, uh, again, lockstep with how uh, Detroit and all the big automakers were built, built. They put their good, cool stuff in their flagship car, and it's, it's going to keep going. So that is... Our Model S Plaid report, thank you for that, Ian. Have you heard much more about any Mustang Mach-E problems? Not much well, about the problems. Uh, I know they're still going on. I know that uh, they released the GT trim, so that's out now. Okay. But not much about the problems. Well, you know, the learning curve of electric vehicles is going to be there for every auto manufacturer. Uh, I do know that with my Model 3, I get a lot of software updates. And I'm betting, and I have this guessing game here because I don't know, but they're taking data from my car. I believe uh, uh, one of the central keys to Tesla's success is a centralized 
artificial mm -hmm. intelligence system, system, and their cars are telling them what is going on. So if uh, Mustang and Ford take, I don't know that they have that, but I do know that during some time periods, I might get two or three or four software and, and Wi-Fi interconnections with Tesla. What are they doing with all that? Because it's a 30-minute you know, conversation here. Yeah. They're taking data from me, and they're getting data uh, sent out to the car and, and refining things. So uh, that is probably another one of their big advancements. So anyhow, Ian has done a lot on the Ford uh, Electric Lightning. Uh, a lot of people are very excited about that. I have uh, uh, a great love for pickups. I've been involved with pickups for years, still own a pickup, my wife and I. Um, I've fixed them up. It's American that you buy a pickup and you put something on it. And that's, you know, uh, now going to be the battery and the generators. Uh, why don't you give us some of the technical data on the, the Ford and the pickups there, Ian? Well, uh, right now, uh, since we're on the Lightning, um, a little bit of cool news about the Lightning. I'm sure everyone saw the president getting to drive the uh -huh, Lightning. I saw that, yeah. uh, it's got uh, two battery options, which Ford won't tell us anything about. Um, but the you know the guess is that they're going to use the same packs as the Mach E, the standard range and the which, extended uh, range. Which pouch type? Uh, but it's pouch type. I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure it's pouch. Yep. Um, okay. And, uh, you know, 230 miles of range on the standard stuff and 300 on the extended range, mm -hmm. uh, which is not bad. It's pretty good. Um, it's only dual motor, though. The only okay. way you can get it is dual motor. Um, but uh, the big thing is, uh, you know, it's got 11 outlets on it, so a ton, so you can use it, hook you your stuff up to it. The truck begs you to go over to your friend's house and like pull out your miter box and possibly a little, little <laughs> air compressor and run and paint his, build something or paint his car yeah. while you're with your truck. <laughs> I'm telling you, men are dreaming about this right now <laughs> somewhere and probably in Texas or Oklahoma. You just now, now you're going to want to go do something in your truck. Yep. I can see it coming. Anyhow, keep going. Especially, uh, Speaking of Texas, with the big outages and yeah. Ford, you know, having hearing about a lot of F-150 users oh. using those to power their house, well, Ford listened, and uh, the Lightning now uh, has an inverter in it that you can use to power your home for three days on a full charge of the vehicle. That is the big secret, probably, in the entire messaging. I don't know that anybody, this is something that everybody wants. It's the dream. It's actually... Right after driving on sunshine, and maybe the self-driving car, the car that plugs into your house and you live off, those are the three fantasies in the sustainable world. And now we've got all three of them in reality. Uh, it's going to be a changer. I bet people are going to want it. So that, that's going to drive some business. That's a good report. The craziest thing about it, it only starts at $39,000. They did that right. You they can, got in there and they got it affordable. Uh, that's going to that's gonna break through. Uh, that's probably really not a real solid electric vehicle that you'd want to buy in the $39,000 range like that. $39,000 is the price of a Model 3, yep, yep. and that's not a truck. Yep. I got stopped uh, at the charge station, by the way. For some good old Southeast Missouri boys out in their big Ford truck. And they were ready to get an electric vehicle and they wanted to know all about it. That's cool. So they're, they're cracking. It's traditional. Again, I think we're back to the uh, Android versus Apple. Mm -hmm. The whole picture. The Ford truck is traditional. It's still a Ford truck. It still looks like a Ford truck. It's got a regular gauge cluster. It's got a regular gauge cluster. Got a little shifter in it, so the regular uh, Ford truck user is going to slip right, right over into America's best-selling truck. Just you got electric. that exactly right. Um, on the other end of stuff, uh, you know, when you talk about Ford, you got to talk about Chevy, uh, GMC with the Hummer. They mm. uh, they talked about the Hummer. 
Uh, they, you know, went and did a bunch of public release on the SUV, but they're doing a truck. And the Hummer truck is not nearly as cheap as the Lightning Over starts. Over 100 in it? 90,000, something like that? Starts at 79. 79? Okay. Um, well, but, you know, but Hummer's always up there. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it's a GMC. Uh, you know, the Hummer was one of the first vehicles that got negative gas mileage. <laughs> 0.19 per mile. <laughs> so I hope it gets a little bit of it. Jack, by the way, the owner and the founder of the company here, bought the second Hummer sold in the United States. That's pretty he cool. Had, he had, a, he had a, I know that. it was really big in the internet, and he went to the dealership right after Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> bought his Hummer. That's that awesome. Was a, that was always one of his cool stories, which he always had colorful stories here. But, uh, <laughs> That's cool. Anyhow, the Hummer, it's a big one. I mean, it's a hoss. It's a good name to put yeah, on yeah. something. You'll have plenty of cult following. There is going to be... And that may be how the breakthrough happens, but I'm telling you, Ford's bread and butter in it here. I yep. mean, that's going right down the center. Transit, Mustang, and yeah. Lightning. I'm betting the Mustang is going to look like a real Mustang soon. What do you want to bet? They've talked about it. I bet They've it They've talked does. about it. I got, and then it's going to go kaboom. I don't know. They, they sort of have to learn. Electric vehicles are not gasoline vehicles. No. And you've got to have a way to troubleshoot, collect the data, and learn from them. So. The, uh, the Hummer comes with, you can get it single, dual, or tri-motor. Two in the rear, one in the front if you do try. That's a pretty, yeah, I like that. Okay. Um, it's uh, got 11,500 pound towing capacity, so you haul plenty. That's a big trailer. Most of the camping trailers, for those of you that aren't in the trailer world, you know, seven, 8,000 pounds is pretty traditional. You load it up, so that'll pull you you know, pull a pretty good size 30, 30 plus foot trailer yeah. out to the out to the local state park and you can bring your barbecue grill along with you probably. The, what else about it? Uh, it's got a 200 kilowatt hour pack uh, using GM's Ultium batteries. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty quick, three and a half to 60, which is a lot of- That's very that's fast. That's qu quick for a 10,000 pound That's moving a vehicle. lot of battery, a lot of, yeah. 200 kilo. That's moving a lot of stuff. Um, but uh, it's got a ton of cool off-road stuff for it now, yeah. just, you know, like the H1. I watched um, the video where it went, walked up to the, yeah, the sheared the cliff walk. and let, crabbed up, a, yeah. which was pretty cool. I mean, I'll give them that one. Yeah, yeah it's four-wheel steering, got the crab walking. Yeah. It's got yeah. a, an air ride setting where you can raise it six inches, yep. which is pretty big. Um, that is, yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, you can't talk about EV trucks without talking about the Cybertruck. Yep. Uh, which, you know, I'm sure it's been beat to death and everyone's talked about it a lot, but it's also three motors, tri single and dual, um, mm -hmm. rear wheel drive, single motor. Um, it's uh, the fast one's three second O to 60, which is even more nuts. Um, but a regular one's still six and a half, which is, you know, your passenger car. Oh. Um, it's a. Uh, Base is 250 miles of range. Uh, the long range is 500 miles, what they're trying to do, which is, that's far. That's all, yeah, it is. I bet that's where that 4680 is going to show up. Yeah. I just got a hunch. You can call me the prognosticator. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm betting on that one. Hummer does 300 miles, which is a lot better than the other one. Yeah, yeah there is a. Uh, uh, that's well they just need to get it up and humming yeah it's no. supposed to be next couple of years why did not general motors do the chevy civil silverado they're doing it are they going to do they that? they are they're talking about it and they don't have a lot of info about it yet but so they i was said i thought the they had some backdoor deal with rivian or something i don't think kind so of rivian kind of looks general motors to me but they okay. uh they're uh the silverado i think is going to be based on the hummer platform by the way, do you know what Rivian owners are doing right now today? What? Waiting. <laughs> They're waiting because they don't have a truck. But it will be cool when it gets here. Yeah. You know, and <laughs> if you're still alive, I guess. Yeah. But anyhow, we wish them all the best. I love trucks. I worked in the truck business for 15 years of my life, and uh, uh, they are a, a mainstay in Americana. Yeah. You pull your trailer. You haul 
your groceries, you got to put accessories on them. Tailgating. You go camping in them. You go tailgating. I mean, uh, you sleep in them. Uh, you know. So Amer you take, Americans got to have their trucks. Americans got to have their trucks. I think they're going to love electric. Uh, but it is a wonderful time to be here at EVTV. Mm -hmm. And it's really uh, some of the uh, completion of, of the early days of the dreams. We really saw uh, half-hearted efforts mm -hmm. of converting uh, already ICE cars to electric to now it is a full engineered mass conglomerate that is just feeding off each other. You're gonna you're seeing really tremendous advancements in, in really human civilization now. Uh, it's happening. Uh, all of you that are, have been with us early, you should just be very happy and be be participant in it. Be encouraging to all. Uh, we need all the electric vehicles we can get out there, and we need charge stations. Mm -hmm. Charge Point, by the way, closed at 29 today. I told when That's I told good. you, I should have listened a little better. It was a $20 a share, so that one's moving. Uh, there was a lot of uh, a lot of talk about the infrastructure, and basically, it's growing. Uh, electric vehicle charging. Uh, has, has so many advantages besides being clean energy, sustainable, renewable. Uh, it also has implications where we're not dependent on oil and gasoline to fuel our economy. People will be somewhat energy independent. So mm -hmm. we certainly encourage all that's going on in the government and the administration to keep improving their electric vehicle uh, packages so we can get more charge stations out there. Yeah. Now, let's go on to what we've been working on over the last really three or four weeks. Yeah. We have got a solar generator built on a trailer. Let's go take a look. Okay, here we are with the EVTV portable solar generator or the uh, portable solar trailer. Uh, these have been uh, popular fodder over. YouTube videos for the last few years, a lot of talk about them. Uh, we are putting together really a, a proof of concept. Uh, right now we're doing a build uh, for our viewers to see uh, what all the components are needed to get all this together. It started with a trailer that I got from like the Harbor Freight or mm -hmm. the mail order company. <laughs> uh, by the time it was said and done here, got it assembled, it was four or five hundred dollars. We added a very strong structure. So this is L angle steel. L angle steel welded. A three sixteenths wall. Uh, one thing we have learned over the years at EVTV with a lot of our builds, uh, overkill is always appropriate uh, and we like that concept. So it's got welded uprights, additional support. Uh, but a very strong frame, uh, and I noticed that really in a lot of the other builds that we looked at before we got this together. You need a pretty substantial structure, a racking to hold up solar panels. Uh, we also have with the trailer stabilizers. Yep. Uh, that is also uh, a pretty standard part. You have a pretty good span of, of the solar panels when they're uh, uh, extended, and this allows for a very secure and very solid mounting. So the, 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 the first part of the mechanics of building a solar trailer is the trailer itself, mm -hmm. uh, and probably the uh, uh, support of the solar panels and the stabilizers are the two yeah. critical functions. These stabilizers are also, you can change them to different heights, so if the ground is not level, you can change it to whichever height you want. We also have one more in the front that we can... Uh, move it around, move around the trailer, which I've had trailers for years, Yep. and you really like that part, <laughs> because uh, if you don't have the wheel on front, it gets very cumbersome after yeah. just a few feet. But so, that, yeah, that will allow you to really have a mobile system, because if you have all these components uh, in then, your trailer to start with. The height of the trailer is 
a little awkward right now. Yep. It's very good bumping into height. So yeah, we've got extra little rubber edges, <laughs> uh, and that is because not me, but other people <laughs> got near this with their head. Yeah. So you would have to uh, wear your uh, height location is or something you're. Yeah. So we, we picked this height because when we fold the panels in, it actually kind of lines up with just enough space above the wheel well. Mm -hmm. So it, it looks like a tight build. But this is again our proof of concept. So the next one we'll change those dimensions around a little bit. Yep. We have uh, uh, three hinges on top. Yep. Or 70 pound hinges. 70 pound rated, three of them holding up each panel. In the center we have a, one of our flexible solar panels. Uh, I really like those on top. Uh, we have sold those for years. Uh, they are very easily mounted and right on the surface. Yep. You don't have any wind, drag, or catch. You also have uh, uh, a little bit of a rock, uh, uh, any sort of debris resistance, whereas the, the glass panels up top we thought could be a little more susceptible to breakage. So we put the flexible panel up front. This is not an AC coupled system, which yes. we changed a little bit. So we're using three Talson 270 watt panels and instead of doing AC coupling through the inverter, since it's a smaller pack, we are using three Genesun uh, DC, uh, charge controllers. So they're converting the DC voltage of the panel to the DC voltage of the battery pack we have inside. Yep. And for this, we're actually using LifePo4, uh, 16 of the 80 amp hour cells, mm -hmm. so that we can uh, kind of test out different battery chemistries here. And so that Jensen is rated for that LifePo4 voltage. And how much power are we getting out right now, Richard? We're putting out 640 watts. Yep, so these are 820 in total. 810 in total. 810. So you are right around 80%. We waited till exactly noon to film this segment. In the, the summer sun, heat. In the summer heat, directly overhead, so that we would get an accurate uh, output. I get multiple calls and people really ask about what the bare minimum is. They all try to put the math together. And, uh, I would say your ratings a lot of times are based on straight up noon, good sunshine. Uh, but even in that conditions, we're still showing about 80%. Over the years of being here at EVTV, working with people, working with Jack and the batteries, 80% is kind of a percentage that always comes up. So if you're factoring your math at home, you know, I have that rounding error in there, 10% <laughs> on the bottom, 10% on the top. They come in around that 80 percent. So this is a window unit air, air conditioner we are just kind of testing as a load. So we have a basic inverter that converts that DC into uh, AC and we're just plugging this into the 110 output and this pulls about 100, uh, 1,400 watts so we are kind of netting it towards the negative but this is not going to be running all day. So mm -hmm. whenever it shuts off once the temperature is reached we can charge it back on solar. And again, like I said, this is a proof of concept. So the four kilowatt hours of storage we have right there, right mm -hmm. now, with the solar support, we can still get about eight to 10 hours yeah. of uh, air conditioning. And that is, uh, again, what a lot of the customers, when they phone in, they've got a little RV or a small office, or they're trying to get some sort of a solar system and a usable number. So here we have three panels small air conditioner, four kilowatt pack. That system is maintaining itself, it's working. The air conditioner worked really well. Yep. I would say, you know, if you're in the smaller systems, you're staying mainly with 110 loads. Uh, you're there to somewhat watch it. Those are some good numbers. So, uh, right, four so kilowatts. Let's uh, turn on the invert. Uh, air conditioner and then uh, let's go inside and talk a little bit more about uh, the technical details of this project. But this, this, this one, this one, small house. It's nice and cool. Fairly good size RV. It'll run warm for sure. Awesome. Let's go inside. Okay. So we're going to dive into a little bit about the technical details on our solar trailer. 
And I wanted to start off with our uh, um, mounting for the panels. So we have those three 70 pound rated hinges, door hinges really, that we're using for the panel. And we came up with a different um, way of mounting it after about three different ideas. So I just wanted to kind of run through them. Uh, first, we had the gas strut that we were using. So this is a 50 pound, so it needs 50 pounds of force to compress. Mm -hmm. But this length wasn't the right uh, length that we needed to have the panel mounted up. So it's a 40 pound panel, but when you try to mount it with the hinge on one side and a gas strut in the middle, we calculated the forces to come to about 100 pounds uh, since we weren't at a full straight angle. So it's not long it. enough. Yeah, it wasn't long enough and also the gas strut wasn't strong enough even though it's, this is a 50 pound and the panel is 40 pounds. And so that plan didn't work and these gas struts aren't very cheap. So we kind of put that to rest. And the next idea was a locking hinge. So the That's idea cool here one. is you have a pressing lock and it opens up. That lock again. And locks at 90 degrees. So this is actually rated for about 400 pounds. Oh yeah, 400. And, and this was wow. only about $25 for two of these on Amazon. And so we were thinking of mounting this to the frame and then mounting the panel on this side. But the problem with this was our frame was designed before we planned this. So this, we didn't have a place to mount this side on the back. In the front, we could mount this to the panel. But or maybe back, we can use it for a nice one. Nice next one. So trailer. yes, our second or our next prototype, we would probably use something like this because 440 pounds, this is plenty to handle the panel. It can be really good on sort of panels. Yep, and since it has that locking mechanism, it's very easy to open and close. Yeah, very and easy to do the operating. Yep, it's just four screws up in the front and three screws here on the back. Mm -hmm. And this is plenty enough to hold it. And the another advantage of this is that this is not related to the height from the ground. This is fixed to the frame. So no matter where the uh, uh, trailer itself is, even if it's on a on not hinge level, a not level heel. ground, uh -huh. this is going directly onto the trailer, so it's, it'll hold it 90 degrees all the time. And then I wanted to go to the design that we are using right now. This is T-Track aluminum, and you can see there's two lines. It extends over each other. And uh, this was about $30 is what Richard got these for. And we use a simple clevis pin with a locking pin to it too. Show this. Yep. And um, with a couple holes that we drilled for the different heights we wanted. And this basically holds the weight of the panel when it's extended out. And then we can simply remove the pins, fold it in and tuck it in the side when the panel comes down flat. That's really neat. So this is what we are using right now in our proof of concept. Um, we are going to run through a couple more ideas before we go on to our prototype. But I just wanted to kind of give you guys some idea of what we're doing there. Mm -hmm. So that's the solar mounting. Next, let's go into the solar Jensen. power conversion. We are using Jensen DC uh, solar chargers. So the reason we did this is we tested with using end-phase microinverters. We put three panels outside, yeah. and we connected three end-phase microinverters and ran it to a Signia inverter and ran that into our battery pack. And we found out with the three panels, we were getting about four to 500 watts. So it was rated for 810, but we were only getting about yeah. half Depends or on a little the more time. power. And that was because we found out with big systems, AC coupling makes sense. I mean, you have a large number of loads, large number of battery packs, and large amount of solar, mm -hmm. uh, that loss is not significant. But when you go into a smaller pack with like four kilowatt hours of storage and a small amount of uh, solar panels, volts, DC. the DC uh, charge controllers turn out to be more efficient. They, this one with the three panels, and the life of four batteries, we get about 600, 650, 700 sometimes uh, watts of power from that 810 watt rated panel. So that's why we decided to go ahead and use three of these. And this is under, we mounted it on the panel and the wiring goes directly to the panels. So this puts out um, 56 volts maximum, so which is the maximum voltage for 16 of those uh, life before batteries. 
And uh, we have plenty of stock of these, which uh, Richard will talk about later. Uh, we might be going to be putting out for a sale. Um, but yeah, these are simple 80 amp hour cow batteries. And um, we have them sitting around the shop, so that's why we use those for the build. And we cannot use this with our ESP32 Tesla BMS, so we had to get a BMS for that. So what did we get? Uh, so without using our BMS and Tesla BMS, actually we're using uh, another brand called Orion BMS. Actually, uh, this one's pretty cool. Uh, saw a lot of people using it. I uh, see along, on the online like a uh, forum or videos, people say they they use it, looks pretty cool, and set up their own solar system or anything. Yep. And then we really want to try something different, so that's why we we thinking using our the like before the cop 80 amps hour uh, battery power uh, batteries, and then uh, because we cannot use our uh, BMS working on that, so that's why we tried using the Orion BMS and uh, set it up with yep. the uh, Orion BMS to test the uh, Orion BMS uh, in our sol uh, solar trailer programs. Yep. So these batteries aren't salvage batteries. These are brand new, directly from the manufacturer, yep. unused, zero cycles on them really. And so, so yeah. we wanted to figure out how we can use a system using just these batteries instead of our regular Tesla BMS and the Tesla salvage modules. So what we ended up with is the Orion. So how was it setting it up, Ziki? Uh, set up actually <laughs> taking us like three to four weeks to figure out how to really use it like just do some regular setting and then make it run no faults <laughs> it take me for a while actually yeah. uh, I sent an email to the Orions and then talking to the guy who uh, runs the Orions and, and I think he he should be the uh, the guy uh, uh, runs this Orion uh, the whole production He's a pretty uh, cool guy, actually. He's uh, once I send an email, he reply, he usually reply my email pretty quick, probably like in thirty minutes, I think. Cool. Yeah, he's pretty awesome, and he usually uh, giving some. Uh, uh, he can get your uh, problem pretty quick and see like once I got the fault code, like internal hardware code or something, and then I send a snap a snapshot, getting from my computer and then send it to to him. He can pretty uh, pretty fast and figure out what's what's happening and what's wrong. Yep. So far, actually, yeah. So we want to say something. Yeah. So the reason we can't use our ESP32 BMS is because we don't have uh, a way to balance these batteries or to communicate uh, to get the cell voltages. Mm -hmm. You would need a multiple number of cell vo uh, voltage sensors. So in the Junior or IM BMS too, they have up to 16, and um, we also need a way to balance them. So since we don't have that right now. That's why we went ahead and worked with the Orion for this project. And so they have a way to balance 16 cells, and they can communicate and measure the voltages of those 16 cells to say if they're in balance or if they need to be balanced. And what else did we find out, Sigi? Um, actually, uh, I can tell some uh, story about or the whole setup of the Orion BMS. Like uh, from the beginning, uh, like the uh, first, uh, first one and two weeks, we. Uh, uh, installed this hardware and then we try to reading the manuals user manuals and figure out how to do the installations and then actually it, it looks pretty easy and then simple to set up mm. for hardware parts it's only one small like like the picture show up it's a one small uh, plastic box and having all this uh, circuit boards set up inside and to like toggle on and off for like a logical uh, uh, functions and also that one having uh, three different uh, connections, actually it's uh, connectors on that. One's the uh, serial port, and uh, another one's the main I.O. connector, and the third one is the voltage tab connector. So the serial port, I'll say is a little bit old. They are kind of using like RS-232 mm -hmm. connector on it. So I was taking for like a while looking out of the shop, to finding a USB to the RS-232 cable yep. <laughs> to connect on it. Yep. So and yeah, for ours, our BMS, we use a USB Type A, which is the regular printer cable. So yep. those are also kind of old, but easier to find. I yeah, would say. also like a printer <laughs> printer cable. If you have yeah. a printer, you should have the cable too. They are definitely more sturdy uh, with the kind of compared to like USB Type B or a mini uh, connector. So the Type A definitely has the advantage. 
Yeah. And then uh, for our IOs, I guess we just have the heat enable and charge enable, but the number of things you can do with them are multiple, many. So what else do they yeah, have? That's a hardware setup. And uh, also need to do the voltage tap connectors. That one, they have a, all, uh, actually not a signal, I think it's a 18 wires. Hmm. It's a two ground wire and then uh, and 16, the positive wire connected to all the gotcha. cells. And then you need to set up that one too within the battery uh, battery trap, yeah. and then those are Norlock and parts of the yep. M6 bolts, everything. We can put a picture up of a nice wiring yeah, that we'll we did. Yeah, we'll put a picture right here. And then the, um, you can see all the wiring tracing in back into the uh, BMS here on the side. Yep. And um, so yeah, we also have a temperature sensor that we put on it with a, a thermistor, thermistor, right? Yes. Yep. So they sent that to, to us, but we kind of... Oh, actually, that's just something else there. We missed it on the packaging. Actually, I'm not figuring out. Uh, when the package in there, I was going to see uh, three connectors and something on the top. Feels like uh, wires or something. I don't know. And then the Danu was asked me, like, where does the thermistor go? I said, I don't know. And then I think you got a new order from somewhere. Yep. So I got Richard to buy us five more thermistors, but they were like... Uh, Ten dollars for all of them, so okay. it wasn't that bad. And then I see this. Oh wait, Daniel, I think we have this. So what they weren't labeled very yeah. well. So I say, oh, this is a mister. Okay, I think I know where it is. <laughs> yep. So we kind of missed that. Um, but yeah, other yep. than that, setting up uh, the wiring was kind of a pain. But when our case, we communicate with the Tesla BMS, so that is already done for us. So all we had to do is plug that harness in to get the data from the BMS uh, yep, for the that's Tesla. True. Which, whereas this, we had to manually go in and put so every tab, single yeah, battery. tab installations. And also, since this was only four kilowatt hours with just 16 cells, it was much easier to build. If we had gone into eight kilowatt hours, we That'd would have hard. to place the batteries in different configurations and put the taps in different places. Parallel batteries, yep. it would have been a lot more work. So, since this was proof of concept, that's why we just stuck with the four kilowatt hours and 16 cells. Yeah, good for uh, testing, I yep. mean, so far. And also, uh, uh, the third connector I was talking about is the main I.O. connector. That's the one I think we might still have some issues and I'll figure <laughs> out too. Uh, it having a, like, uh, I think 10 to 12 different, different uh, pins on it and having a lot of different function, having like a power, uh, power, ready, uh, power ready pin and then charge char uh, char enables and uh, uh, charge safety, uh, charger safety enable, and uh, multiple purpose enable, and multiple purpose and input, and multiple purpose output, and output <laughs> one, output two. So yeah. it'll be like confusing, you know, when you start to uh, work on this. And also their manuals are pretty cool, giving a lot of words to, uh, like they, they do giving a pretty good explanation, but that's explanation for some, uh, for some, insp uh, uh, for some like, it, it, uh, for some reason, maybe I, I, I'm not figuring out really well. So, I mean, it's a cool. And when, when we set up the whole thing and also like uh, follow the, uh, follow the uh, user manual of the uh, utility, the software on the Windows, I, uh, I set up on, on my computer and then I connect a USB to uh, the USB, the serial port to the uh, BMS. And then it's, uh, we having uh, we're having some uh, fault codes uh, happening in the last uh, two or three weeks. Yep. Yeah, first time I remember it was like the, uh, the internal hardware fault, hmm. internal hardware. Yep. So I was thinking how that happens. And then I sent an email to them and they say, oh, actually, uh, you should try to take a snapshot from me and then I'll figure out what happens on, on your BMS modules. And then I... Uh, I got it a snapshot. Actually, it's a function in that software, and then I send it to them, and they say, "Actually, you know what? Your uh, software looks like a little bit old version. It's like 3.31. That's a little bit old version. You should update to the newest version." And then he gave me a link. So uh, I checked the link. Actually, I was thinking, "Oh, so this link is kind of like a privately. I cannot find it on their website." So they're sending me the link and then, then download it and then upload, uh, upload it to the software and then uh, I think it, it fixed that uh, problem. And what they explain, they say they have a, some uh, like uh, critical, uh, like critical settings. Mm -hmm. 
like your uh, your system like running uh, more uh, kind of like a more precisely. Mm. So once you have, uh, oh, actually, it's a, wait a second. The sorry, I was trying to figure out the word I want to say, but I forgot it. What I still say now? Is it like the limits were kind of tight in the older yeah, yeah, software? Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Actually, yeah, he got it. Is it kind of like the old version having the tight limits? So that's why getting the internal hardware faults came out. Gotcha. And then with the updates, and then kind of figure out that fi fix that problem. Was the software update pretty easy to do, or how how long? Did Actually, it take software you? update is pretty easy to do. I think he uh, set up like a. Uh, e, .exe file okay. and putting it into it feels like a more e, more uh, more close like a you know regular uh, uh, Windows uh, application. Gotcha. Installations. Yep. So yeah. we we also do have all the updates where we just plug in with a USB cable and if you type update equal one, it'll actually connect to the internet if you have an internet connection already. Mm. Download the file for you and update it already and just after typing that one command. So in this one, you have to download the file, connect with the USB, and then... Oh, actually, you need to find a file. Oh, no, I mean, those <laughs> talking to the talking to the help, asking for help, yeah. for technical help, and then they will Get send the you a file. file. Yep. That's, yeah. that's just fun, too. Yeah, and but, also after that, uh, we have a next file is causing by, is called a high cell voltage too high. Uh, actually, it's part of our problem, too. Yeah, and 50 50. So this was part of the learning curve. So yep. our experience with the Tesla BMS, when we charged it, we can see it actively balancing. It would balance By if itself. any cell was going too high, it would put a resist on it, bring it down to match everything else. Yeah. But with this one, what we soon found out was it doesn't do bulk balancing. Nope. It kind of does it over time with a slow rate. And also if it tends to warm up too much, it'll pause balancing until it cools down enough to balance again. Yeah, well, take slowly down. Yeah, but the whereas balancing. with the Tesla BMS, it kind of balances it as it's charging, and then it can kind of bring the voltage down to match everything else. Whereas yep. in this one, we found that it only balances um, kind of, they basically said it is just much slower balancing than uh, what we expected. What we expected, yeah. Yeah, that's so, so far. we were hoping that it would just balance by itself, and then nothing would overshoot. But we were getting to around 54, 55 volts, and we were getting the high cell warning. Yeah. And we were trying to figure out why is this one higher than the rest, and why is it not bringing it down? <laughs> it and took a while. A couple emails later, we figured out, OK, so it doesn't do that. <laughs> yeah, not, yeah, not that perfectly, like a Tesla BMS yes. so far. So, so what we really found out was when our, uh, Richard purchased the Orion BMS and handed it to us, we thought it was oh, simple plug and play, turn it on, it'll do its own thing. Yeah. But couple of weeks later, <laughs> we're still finding out that, okay, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So Yeah, it's a little bit much than what we uh, expected. Yep, there's definitely a learning curve to it, and um, it's, it's, a, it's so far it's working. We are mm -hmm. going on our second full cycle right now, but we're still testing a couple yeah. more things. So that's part of the, uh, I think their system, like um, their design, mm -hmm. maybe as, you know, different with uh, Tesla BMS. And also yeah. why, why I say probably like, uh, it's kind of like a, 50% uh, of our fault too is like what Daniel says. Still, we are on the learning curve. So actually, the cell, the high cell voltage to high fault, we got causing by we're not using the charge enable functions. Mm -hmm. So you don't have the charge enable function. You cannot uh, to communicate with the uh, uh, genesis we're using. Uh, also, we can call it like a similar like an MTBT to stop the charging from the solar. Yeah. So well, actually. I don't think it's mentioned in the user manuals. Yeah. And but instead of communication, it's actually just a 12 volt ground on and off that just turn, turns yeah. on and off the relay. Yeah. But yeah, it wasn't just kind of clear cut. We had to kind of dig through manuals, figure out what wire had to go where. I mean, they have a, a diagram with showing what pin is what, but we didn't know which of those we all had to wire and which one we didn't have to wire. So that was kind of a trial and error, really, trying to figure Learning. that out. Learning pair. But yeah, so. <laughs> With life before batteries, Orion was what we heard supposed to be the best uh, BMS out there. So it's it's pretty good, and uh, we can recommend it. Uh, but there is definitely a learning curve to it. And as for used salvage Tesla batteries, I think mm -hmm. our controllers are still the best one out there. Um, going as for balancing, communicating with the modules, um, it's just it does such a better job with uh, other BMSs that are on the market. I think from what I saw on, the, uh, on some research papers, 
the Tesla's BMS and the Chevy's, uh, Chevy Bolt and Chevy Volt's, their BMS is, I think, two of the uh, still like best of the uh, best of worst EVs uh, BMS mm -hmm. around the world still. So yeah. I think Tesla really make a lot of big efforts and take a lot of time to running this whole process working their BMS out. Yep. So that that's why I think it, why Tesla BM is still the best one, one of the best one around the world. Indeed. Yeah. Well, cool. So and also, actually, uh, recently we're still working on this uh, solar trailer programs, and also we're having some other issues too, like the charger safety fault that we recently got, and then we, after I actually, I think we figured out by ourselves, mm. and then because of the oh yeah, actually the BMS having the issues like. When you're charging, when you're charging the battery, it shows a negative. No, oh, yeah. When it's discharging, it's a positive. Yeah, it's kind of uh, depends on from person <laughs> to person in a way too. Because if you look at it from the battery side, it's one perspective. Goes if you out, look at it from the BMS positive. side, it's a different perspective. So you can have a plus or minus based on charging. But yeah, we went ahead and selected that one. Yeah, I toggled it. Toggle switch. Yeah, once said, I toggled uh, it, and then the, that's why this fault came out. And then after reading well, the, the user manual. The toggle was that it would say it would reverse uh, yeah. the positive to show negative, and then the negative to show positive, the charging current. Yeah. But we didn't know that it would also cause an error for us. So once we went ahead and <laughs> untoggled it, that's when the error really went away. Yeah, that's right. So true. there's a lot more to learn with that BMS. But, yeah, um, I think still have something we, we need to figure out too. So actually, still we're still working on this project for so far. So I, I believe we'll figure out soon, but probably like in another couple of weeks. Yep. All right, and uh, I think that's all we have for technical details about this uh, project. It's still in progress. Uh, we'll definitely have some more videos out about it with our next prototype. And we're planning to encase it. We're trying to do some more cool stuff with it. Mm -hmm. We'll have a light on it, maybe. Um, so keep uh, keep forward to that. Uh, keep looking forward to that, and uh, we'll have updates for you. Uh, and before we end, uh, Richard wants to add a little more words before we finish. But, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Hey, that was a lot of fun, and talking about uh, the expansion of the electric vehicle world as well as portable power. The trailer and the portable battery is something. The drivable battery is something that's really going to be part of the conversation here over the next few years. This is an 80 amp hour uh, cow that we have a special purchase on. These are going to be featured in the clearance section of the EVTV.me MotorWorks store and uh, they're going to have a special price on them here for the next few weeks. $49 a piece. We have a few left. First come, first serve. This is our Jenison Lithium uh, eight panel uh, charge controller. These will be special, about $50 off. So you're going to see those on the store at $149. And if you're looking for bargains, you got a build going on. Good time, you can pick up a couple of our clearance items. But in closing, I would just like to say uh, what a world it has become uh, with the electric vehicles and really in the solar movement. Uh, some of the things that we had only dreamed about are now reality today. You're going to be seeing it, you're living it, uh, get you an electric vehicle, keep driving it. It's time to do some DIY solar builds. Uh, they are, uh, I call them the modern hot rod. Uh, they are the next thing for men to be doing. And Jack had a conversation with people years ago. He's like, I need 100,000 of you to go out in your garage and build an electric car. Well, I need 100,000 of you to go out and build your own solar system. It could be a blast. We have several different designs. Uh, there's a lot of technology out there, but we've got your stuff here at EVTV, and you can learn about it and pioneer and introduce your neighbors to solar energy. Anyhow, come back next week for EVTV, but we're going to have more on our solar trailer and more EV news. Talk to you then.